Welcome to another edition of Gethsemane. We're so glad that you are in this place and we're so glad that you have the opportunity to study with us here in Gethsemane. Hey, listen, I want you to hit that like button, that share button. Let's get this message out to all four corners of the world. The world needs to hear the gospel. Also, we're so thankful for all of our supporters. We thank you for not just listening, but partnering with us. Thank you for your love seeds that you sow uh, into this ministry, whether it's a dollar, five dollars, whether it's a hundred whatever is on your heart we thank you so much you can hit that link below uh, and you can be able to give and support this ministry we're going to open up with a word of prayer and then we'll begin our lesson on today Father in heaven, we thank you for loving us and we thank you for your word and we thank you, Father, for your grace. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to be able to correct uh, what is an error. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. So we'll begin our lesson on today. Our question uh, comes from, and once again, thank you so much for everyone who submits your questions. You can put your comments in the uh, questions in the uh, comment box, and we'll do our best to get to as many questions uh, as we possibly can. Also, please don't forget to subscribe, and also please don't forget to let us know where you're listening from. Uh, and I want to thank those who have done that. Uh, I just want to do a quick shout out. Uh, we have those from uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, we have those from uh, Little Rock. Uh, we have those from Horn Lake. Uh, Levi Church of Christ, shout out to y'all. Uh, I also uh, want to thank those from uh, Sacramento, California, uh, who are watching. We have those from uh, Washington, D.C. I want to do a shout out to the Sweetland Road Church of Christ. Sweetland Road Church of Christ. Thank you so much uh, for those who are, are, are tuning in. We have those from Georgia. Uh, we have those from Saginaw, Michigan. Bless you. Bless you so much. Uh, for tuning in, uh, for tuning in to uh, uh, to Gethsemane, uh, we also have those from Kendra, Arkansas, uh, from Kendra, Arkansas, uh, from Medford, Oregon, Medford, Oregon. Thank you so much. We have uh, also from Las Vegas, Nevada, Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in. Uh, I want to try to get as many as I possibly can. Uh, McPherson. Kansas. I've been there. I've preached there. Thank you so much for those who are tuning in from McPherson, Kansas. Um, and also uh, we have, I want to make sure, I want to make sure uh, I don't skip over. This is, uh, we have those from South America, uh, Guyana, uh, South America. Thank you so much for tuning in to this broadcast. Uh, your support and uh, your presence is a blessing. We have those from Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, we have those uh, who are watching from Waco, Texas. Um, so, uh, so many uh, from all over the world. We have those who are watching from Hillcrest Church of Christ in Atlanta. God bless. Shout out to the Hillcrest Church of Christ uh, in Atlanta uh, for, for those who are watching there and tuning in. Uh, we pray that this has been a blessing. Also, shout out to uh, the North Las Vegas. Vegas, uh, MLK uh, Church of Christ. So uh, shout out to that congregation also there uh, in Las Vegas. Also uh, there, uh, those who are from uh, Kentucky. Um, so I just wanted to take some time out uh, to just thank so many of you who pray Hinesville, Georgia. Thank you so much uh, for you tuning in. You tune in faithfully from Hinesville, Georgia. Bless you and bless your family. Um, I, I'm definitely deeply appreciated uh, appreciative of those who tune in, who watch, who pray, not only for the ministry, not only for the gospel go out, but I thank each and every one of you who pray for me personally. So God bless you. I know I've probably uh, missed a few, but I just want to let you know we do read them. We do come across them. Uh, and we just want to thank all of those um, who support this ministry. Um and it's because of you that we are able to continue to get this gospel out uh, and hopefully continue to be a blessing uh, to those who um, who listen. Uh, and ha we have many who have had testimonies of those who have obeyed the gospel uh, since. So God bless you on that. So our question today, 
our question today um and I want to be able to pull that back up. So our question today comes from uh, Christina Hodge, 5397. For my YouTube subscriber, Christina Hodge, 5397. How to deal with separation from your partner the right way. How to deal with separation from your partner the right, right way. Another way of rephrasing that is how do you separate from your husband or your wife the correct biblical way and so I want to say this before I, I dive into the text I believe it's important to exercise every Christian liberty that is available especially when we're talking about marriage uh, and being separated I'm you know you may be married right now and listening to me but you may be separated matter of fact you might be in the house but still separated and nobody at the congregation knows that you're separated or that y'all are having problems or trouble or whatever the case may be. And so I believe it's important. Thank you for the question on separation, because there are not many who teach uh, the subject, uh, who dive into what the word of God says about it. And so with this, uh, I, I pray to not only read from the word of God, but the applications and things that we lay out in this lesson, I pray that it will be a blessing to you. Matter of fact, if you listen to me right now, you may say, hey, listen, me and my husband, we don't have, me and my wife, we don't have any problem. We good. But, but this lesson is for the just in case. Some of you right now are in the middle of conflict in your marriage and you don't know what to do and you're considering certain options. Um, one of the things that's so frustrating from the world is that the world, the first thing that the world throws out when there is a problem is divorce. Hey, you need to uh, counseling our divorce. And one of the things that they don't realize that the word of God gives us is that you do have a biblical option called separation. And so that's what we're going to study on today. Uh, and so with that, uh, I believe it's very important to any anyone that is a believer in Jesus Christ you should not be a um, supporter of families falling apart so I hope that you hear my heart uh, and and I pray that you are able to um, evaluate my spirit that I want to be I pray that every Christian supports marriages, families, and people staying together. Now, if you've seen any of my previous vid videos, I, I understand circumstances and situations, right? But if we can do whatever we possibly can to keep families together, I'm all for it. I, be I believe we should be a supporter of it. Be very careful of your friends. Be very careful of your family members. Some people want to see you so happy so much that they end up pushing you to violate God's word so you can be on your road to happiness. And guess what? You can achieve happiness, but then you got to answer to God of why you did something in an incorrect way. The basis of this question comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And I'm just going to begin in verse one so that you can have context of the chapter, right? Uh, this first Corinthians chapter seven is dealing with relationships and first Corinthians chapter seven is dealing with multiple scenarios. So it's not just dealing with separation it's dealing with marriage and single, all, all type of romantic relationships, right? Are being single. So first Corinthians chapter seven, verse one, now concerning the things you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Let me just stop there just real quick for for and this is for those that are single. Uh, if you're single for some of y'all, y'all not going to make it. To, it ain't good for you to be single too long. I know you want to be picky. And, and so I, I want to let you know, first Corinthians chapter seven is not necessarily marriage advice. Uh, first Corinthians chapter seven, verse one and two is salvation advice. 
So some people read that and be like, no, but I got a high standard. You may have a high standard, but your passions are greater than your standards. And so you are, you did, you're doing a good job trying to hold on, but you're getting weak. And so what the Bible is letting us know is that, and the Bible is aware that you have passions, you have desires. And so you got some people say, I don't want to get married, but you sleeping with everybody that you come in contact with. At some point, you're going to need to make a decision so you can save your soul. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse one and two is not marriage advice. It's not relationship advice. It's salvation advice. So when he says it's good for you to be single, you may have less problems. You may have you end up having more money. You have less concerns. It may be it's OK if you want to be single. Some people want to be single. If you can be single and control your passions, if you can be single and leave people alone. Some of y'all want to be single and you you living with people and sleeping with people and you 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 want all of the benefits of a relationship without being in one. So what the Bible is saying is, nah, you ain't gonna be able to do that. Either you be single and not touch nobody or you be single single or, or, or you get married and and save your soul that's first corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 and 2 don't get mad at the advice the advice is not the bible is not teaching you of of in this text of how to pick a mate it's 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 teaching you how to save your soul right uh you know because some of us got uh passions you know yeah and you ain't gonna, you gonna, you gonna, you gonna, you gonna lose your soul. You gonna lose your soul. So you need to say I do. You need to say I do, cause ah, it's a passion. It took like a month. Ah! And it's a lot of sirens and stuff that's going on uh, in your heart and in your in your loins, and uh, it's burning. So you probably need to go ahead and say I do, so you can go to heaven. That's verse one and two. I hope I broke that down. Uh, you know, for understanding. Uh, let, let's look at verse three. Let the husband render. Unto the wife do benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. So in verse three, first Corinthians chapter seven, verse three says, now, if you're married, now we've already dealt with if you want to be single, then that's good to be single. But if you can't contain, you're going to really need to start to adjust and find a mate so you so you can save your soul. Right. Because uh, you're not going to get to heaven that way. I want you to hear me. You're not going to get to heaven that way. But the women should understand is really uh, I get it, man. I get it. But you can't go to heaven that way. You have to pick, you have to pick somebody. <laughs> you have to pick somebody. Verse three says, but if you're married, now the husband, you are responsible to physically and sexually satisfy your wife. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse three, the husband is required by God to give his body to his wife to satisfy her. Render unto the wife i like the king james version ah it's called benevolence uh and it's due <laughs> the benevolence is due wife may wake up in the morning hey you're in debt you uh, you got some benevolence and 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 i looked at the books and you owe me right the bible also says and likewise also the wife unto the husband it, it the wife's body belongs to her husband and the husband's body belongs to his wife and so what happens in the confines of marriage is that they are supposed to take care of each other, not just spiritually, not just emotion emotionally, and not just financially. You're supposed to take care and address the passions of your husband or your wife physically. All right. And so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here just for a second. We have a lot of brothers and sisters uh, in the faith that are in sin right now. You are actually laying the groundwork for your husband to cheat on you. You are actually laying the groundwork for your wife uh, to step out on you, because when you deny your spouse, what is due them? You got to an answer to God for starving your husband. You got to an answer to God. Why did you starve your wife? I there have been some men that I've known. They have not touched their wives. If you're mad, angry, and here's another thing. You can't get to heaven being uh, and, and, and not forgiving. You have to forgive. Some of some of you brothers are punishing your wives because of something that happened a long time ago and you have not you don't you do not look at talk to or touch your wife. But at the same time, expect her to be faithful. 
there are a lot of people who have cheated and committed adultery uh, but what the church never found out or what the church never knew and we don't talk about this enough is that you can cause your spouse to fall and then the only thing that you do is you cry that they fail without no one really understanding or knowing you were set up there are a lot of wives who were set up. There are a lot of husbands who were set up because when you don't get certain needs met, and maybe this is another lesson, but when you don't get certain needs met, uh, then you leave space for the devil to come in and have his way. And then when the devil has his way, nobody realized that you invited the devil into your home. And maybe you're disciplined enough sexually to withstand. So you said, I don't need it. And you want it. And I want I want to speak this to to several of you. Some of you are very strong and very disciplined. And you say, you know what? I can hold out. And you're being disciplined. You're being holy. You're not messing with anybody. You're not cheating on your spouse. But you're not touching your spouse either. You're not tending to the needs, the emotional, physical needs of your spouse either. So even though you're not cheating on your spouse, you are damaging your marriage by your behavior. The Bible lets us know in verse three, you have a responsibility. Here's the thing. Somebody said, I don't, I don't know if I want to do all that. Well, listen, then then you need to really think about marriage. And if you can't withstand, maybe you should have stayed single. But when you get married. I don't care if it's snowing outside. I don't care if it's raining. I don't care if it's uh, I don't care if it's a good day, if it's a bad day. I don't. I, it doesn't matter if you're a husband or if you're a wife. You're supposed to tend to the needs of your spouse. You're supposed to tend to the needs of your spouse. And so I know there's a lot of emotions that's connected to it. And so if we don't learn to forgive, if we don't learn to take our burdens to the Lord, we will allow our bitterness, anger, uh, resentment to damage uh, something that we you have a responsibility to do. That's verse three. All right. Uh, I want to say this before I move on. If if you're in and, and, and I'm going to say this. If you're in a sexless marriage, then the devil can use that. Uh, and it also means you probably have other problems. I encourage you, stop ignoring those problems. Because then you know what you're going to have? You're going to have a desire to be loved. You're going to have a desire to be touched. You're going to have a desire for somebody to see you. And, and so when you go to work or somebody sees you, you get dressed up and you go to the gas station and you got a compliment. Now, all of a sudden, you want to be the main one to go to the gas station and get gas because she told you that you had broad shoulders or you got dressed up. And he said, hey, I really like I really like that dress. And now you were in that dress every day trying to find it because you're in a you're in a dry place in your marriage and the devil is going to use that like we said before we should all be encouragers and promoters of marriage and marriages stand together but one of the fastest ways that you can kill your marriage is withholding sex from your spouse withholding intimacy from your spouse it is almost evil and wicked knowing that you have the ability to tend to a need of your spouse and you intentionally and purposely, for whatever reason, you withhold it. Now, before I move on, I do understand sometimes there is violence, sometimes there is abuse. And I'm not talking about those categories. I want to say that again. Sometimes there's violence, sometimes there's abuse. And so you deal with that with wisdom. I believe God gives us wisdom. The Bible says we should pray for wisdom. James chapter one. Right. So if you have wisdom and you understand something's going on, you might need to move around. Uh, sometimes there is your 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 spouse is um, is un, undisciplined and have been with so many partners that it's a it's, it's a it's a threat to your life. Right. So I want to say that as well. There's violence. There's abuse. And, and sometimes another form of abuse. If you have a spouse that's constantly in the streets and is constantly uh, romantically active 
outside of the home and you're aware of it sometimes you withhold sex because you understand that is a threat to your health and your family or your children's health right outside of those categories it is wicked and evil to just withhold from your spouse to play games or because you're angry or mad or, or you have some spite all right you would need to repent for that especially putting your spouse in a position because what that does is it plays on the mind it plays on the mind and it causes like i said it is the breeding ground for where a lot of marriages fall apart uh but but really it's deceptive and and um and really is not what god has called us to be if you if you made those vows you need to fulfill those vows the bible says in verse four the wife have not power over her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband have not power over his own body, but the wife. Don't never marry somebody who looks at themselves as this is mine and you have yours. When you get married, your spouse must understand biblically that what they possess is now in your care. If they're not willing to even consider the scripture or have this understanding, you're in a dangerous marriage. Now you're negotiating outside of God's will for marriage. That was never God's will for you to. Hey, listen, and there, there are multiple ways you can operate in marriage. But then God has his vision for how he wants your marriage to be. So even though you make it work and you make your house work and even though things are functioning and the bills are paid, you can literally be outside of the will of God because you did not heed how God intended it to be. The husband's body is belongs to the wife and the wife's body belongs to the husband. Pick wisely who you say I do to. I know you like him and I know he tall and I know she do her nails and I know, you know, her breath is clean and you think, hey, I'll just go with that. I need you to think deeper about who you consider your partner and your spouse. Everybody that you like shouldn't be your wife. Everybody that you are attracted to shouldn't be your husband. Anybody that... Um, because they had your back when you was down doesn't mean they're so that he is supposed to be your spiritual leader and i know everybody left you and i know everybody abandoned you and he was the one that was at the hospital and he wiped your mouth and he was the one uh that really supported you just because you are a support to me doesn't mean that you need to be my uh husband or my wife or spiritual leader or partner or helpmate uh so i want each and everyone to think very wisely if they don't have this understanding understanding because then you'll have problems in the marriage of why you're not getting your needs met you got a bunch of married people walking around thirsty and hungry you see them in worship service killing communion hungry and thirsty and i'm not talking about food they're just hungry and thirsty for attention hungry and for validation uh because they're supposed to get those things from your spouse you got to make sure that who you marry has enough emotional integrity uh, spiritual understanding and intelligence to be able to not only be aware of your needs but also that their cup is big enough and they have the capacity to meet your needs some of you have strong desires and you're going to have to you're going to have to meet somebody or you're going to have to connect with somebody that can meet your needs Right. So if you got a gallon worth of desires, you can't be with somebody who walking around with a liter worth of of um, of needs uh, of, of liquid to give. <laughs> if you got a gallon and they got a liter, y'all not a good match. All right. If you like to talk a lot and you want somebody to listen to you and you want somebody to hear you, then you need to find somebody who quiet and don't mind you talking all day long and talking their ear off. Right. The man walk around with no ears on his face, uh, because, but he love you, though. And, and that works or whatever the case may be. We have a, we have too many couples today that are not equally yoked and they're angry with one another and they're frustrated with one, one another. And we have too many couples that met each other in a season of sin. And now that they're more spiritual, 
they're, they're, having, they're starting to have conflict because you're reading your Bible and now you're praying. Now you met each other in the club. Now you met each other in the street. Now you met each other uh, living, you know, however y'all was living. Uh, but now that you're in Christ and now that you're growing and now that you're developing, you realize that the person that you picked was the version of you that was in the world. And now that you want to be a stronger Christian, you realize that the person you pick don't match where you're trying to go. We got to pick wiser in, 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 in our culture and in this season. You got to pick, you, you got to be very careful of who you choose. Because as you grow, your eyes will change. And you want to make sure that the person that you choose to love, that when you look at them, you love them each and every day. That, that, that's your person. That, that person and, and pick somebody that can help you go to heaven I want to say that this is for the singles pick somebody that, that can help you go to heaven now in dealing with separation I want to, I want to move to our text verse 5 now this is for the those that are married defraud ye not one the other except it be for the consent of Except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So here's uh, I want to lay out some things and I want to break down this verse. So we'll spend the rest of our time in verse five. Um, I want to lay out some things that and, 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 and lay the groundwork for what separation is for biblical separation is for and and how we should be able to move and uh, and we'll break this down in verse five number one biblical separation but the, the very first thing that one a couple um and you can only separate if you're married so we're not talking about if you dating or somebody that's that's not considered here in this text this is for those who are married this is not those who are living together this is not those who are shacking this is for those who have made a covenant with one another and they are married with that being said the very first thing that you would have to identify is what's the problem there is a pain there is a thorn there is a threat to your marriage that's occurring right now. So the very first step of separation is that you need to identify what the problem is. You need to find out what the problem is because it's a threat to your marriage. Because before you consider separation, you have to both understand why. If you don't know the why, it's unbiblical to just leave without a plan. So number one, you need to identify what is the threat, what is going on in your marriage to the point where if you stay in this state, it would be the end of your marriage. It's a threat. That means if this thing is not addressed and this thing is not dealt with, it could be the end of our union. Once you, so that's number one, you need to sit down and you need to sit down if possible with you and your spouse and write down what is the problem. What is the problem and what is the threat to our marriage? Right. It could be their their uh, attitude. It could be disobedience. Uh, and when I say disobedience, I mean disobedience to God. They're not living right. Uh, they are rejecting the faith. Uh, it could be many things. Right. Um, you're always arguing. Uh, you're always accusing there's unforgettable I mean, it could be so many different things that could be a threat to your marriage now here's the thing you may have tried counseling you may have tried talking to friends you may have tried to go on vacations or whatever the case may be I encourage every married couple if you're trying things to one of the things that the Bible allows you to try is biblical separation number one first identify what the problem is once you've identified what the problem is, notice this. The Bible says in verse 5, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be uh, with consent for a time. The, number two, once you've identified what the problem, let me tell you this. The purpose of biblical separation is to come back together again. 
I want you to hear what I just said. The purpose of biblical separation is so that you and your spouse can come back together again. Separation is not preparation for divorce. Biblical separation is not preparation for divorce. Biblical separation is the groundwork and, and one approach to address a problem so that you can come back. In this particular case, there is a withstanding of, of sexual intimacy with your spouse. The Bible says you're not allowed to defraud your spouse from me. You should not intentionally not meet your spouse's needs. But if something is going on in your marriage where you need to stop the intimacy, the Bible says that you can separate, you can stop, you can remove yourself for a time. That means this. Here's that number two. After you've identified the problem, you come together and you develop a plan. Here's the thing. Brother Williams, what do you mean by plan? Let's read it. Except to be with consent, don't miss this part, for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. The biblical process of, of biblical separation is that if you're at a crossroads with your spouse and something is going on and you've been trying to fix it, one of the options that you have in your marriage is to choose biblical separation. Uh, so there are several things that must be in that process. Number one, it can't be forever and it cannot be an emotion. It needs to be for a set time. So one of the things that you may say is you may say, hey, listen, we are at a we are at a really, really bad place. I do not want a divorce, but we need to work on some things, but we cannot do it in close proximity. So what the Bible allows you to do is set a time. But the Bible doesn't put a restriction on that time. So it could be for a week. It could be for a month. It could be for three months. It could be for six months. It could be for a year. It could be for a year and a half, depending on the situation. I want to say this. Whatever time you set, that at the end of that time, the purpose of biblical separation is to come back, not to stay away. The purpose of biblical separation is not for you to uh, explore the world and travel and get, and, 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 and get back to single life. Uh, that's not the purpose of biblical separation. That you, you're not supposed to be uh, and there, there's no such thing as biblical separation and single. See, if you're separated, you're married. I want to say that again. If you're separated, you're married. Some of y'all are dating uh, men and women and they tell you what well, I'm separated. You're dating a married man. You're sleeping with a married man. You're kissing a married man or married woman. When a person says they're separated, that means in the eyes of God, you're still married. You're just in a different location. It is the equivalent of a man that go or a man or a woman who goes to service uh, and they fight for their kind. They live or they work in another. Uh, they have to travel for a month and work in another country. Just because you're not in the same physical location of your spouse doesn't mean that you're free to date, go to the bar and hang out. You're still married. And I want to say this, just because you don't wear your ring doesn't mean that you're not married. You're still, and I don't care in your mind. You may say, I'm so sick of this. You're still married. I just wanted to throw that out there. So biblical separation, biblical separation is supposed to be for a set time. When you reach the end of that time, and here's the thing, it's dangerous to be separated for years because you give space for the devil. You're supposed to apply biblical separation to strengthen your marriage, not to destroy it further. And so with that, the Bible says, look at the end of verse five. You're supposed to give yourself to fasting and prayer. Okay, well, Brother Williams, what am I supposed to be doing uh, during the separation? Both of you should be fasting and praying. And even if the other one is not strong enough to do it, you should be fasting and praying during your separation. I don't care if it's for a week. Maybe it's for three weeks. You say, hey, for 21 days, we need to step away from each other. We're arguing, we're fussing, and we're almost on the verge of fighting. We need to stop. Well, what are you going to do for those 21 days? You need to be fasting and praying. The Bible tells you what you need to be doing. If you are separated and you're not fasting and praying, then your, your, your separation is not biblical. 
You just you just abandoned your spouse. Look at that. That you may give yourself to fasting and prayer. I mean, you are diving, you are diving into fasting and praying. And then the Bible says, you set a time, and then during that time, you have a spiritual regiment that's elevated. I'm not saying you weren't praying before. I'm not saying you weren't reading your Bible before. I'm not saying you weren't doing a lot. But during your time of separation, you elevate those activities because you're trying to get an answer from God and a solution to your marriage. And also during that time, I've known people who were separated. They brought a, a counselor in. And let me say this about counselors. Just because you say you went to marriage counseling doesn't mean that it was beneficial. All counselors are not the same, just like all doctors are not the same, just like all uh, mechanics are not the same. Find a counselor that is trained and is impartial and has no dog in the fight between you and your spouse. I also want to say this. Normally, a lot of wives look for counselors, but you also got to consider your husband as well. So sometimes a woman will feel better with a female counselor and the man already feels like he's teamed up. So one of the things I would encourage you to consider is say, hey, listen, uh, I would like to spend three weeks with this counselor and then I would like to spend three weeks with another counselor. And, and sometimes you have to depend on your husband uh, or depend on your wife. Uh, sometimes if you get uh, someone of the same gender, they feel they feel teamed up on. And if you're really looking for a solution, then put your put yourself in your marriage in the best p position to actually um, have success have success uh and so you one of the things that you may say is hey we're only going to try this counselor for a few weeks and then i have a male counselor i have a female counselor that i would like us to to consider and we'll be able to go from that so i would like six weeks of counseling one with this one with that and depending on uh i, I wanted to, i wanted to lay that out there because sometimes that's an issue and you think well he didn't want to go to counseling and sometimes he didn't want to go to that counselor you got to be open enough. And sometimes your friend found a counselor for you. So you want to go to the one that your friend said, oh, she's really good or he's really good. Uh, but sometimes uh, you need to go to someone who is neutral. Uh, and if you and, and if it's possible, find a Christian counselor with Christian principle. Don't just go to any counselor. Some some just because a person is a marriage counselor, but that but their beliefs, they don't believe in God. They don't pray. So they don't understand when you mean I've, I've been trying to go to worship and God and they don't understand what you're saying because they don't go themselves. You need someone who understands the word of God and can give you tools and, and a good counselor is going to give you tools and give you principles that you can apply and you and your spouse can apply to work on to help heal. It ain't good counseling if you go to counseling and all you do is talk for 45 minutes or 50 minutes and then they wrap up and then say, OK, we'll see you next week. The only thing you're doing is venting. No, I need tools. If you ever go to counseling, ask for tools, ask for homework, ask for things that we can do to be able to work at home so that we can apply those to improve our marriage. Separation. The purpose of biblical separation is to come back together. Then let's look at the end. After you've given yourself to fasting and prayer, the Bible says, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your lack of self-control. So, so here's the thing. If you stay, and this is why I say it's, 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 it's wicked for you to avoid your spouse or stay away from your spouse for too long, you give space for Satan to come in. It's not good to be separate. The purpose of marriage is to be together. But if you're intentionally being distant from your spouse, some of you work too much. Some of you are, are taking on too many projects and your spouse barely sees you. You're killing your marriage and you want your spouse to have self-control and be disciplined while you're absent. The Bible says you need to communicate. You need to pray and give yourself to fasting. Set a time. And then the Bible says, then come back together again. All right. Uh, it's, many times it's beneficial for you to come back together again with a counselor. 
uh, with a mediator so that uh, both can be heard. Sometimes you have people in their marriage, you've lost yourself. You don't even know who you are and, and, and your thoughts and mind. It's all starting to beat you up. You may have to put yourself in a position to say, hey, listen, I really need to consider separation. Your spouse is saying, okay, wait a minute, you're not going to separate from me. Whenever you hear somebody say, well, you, you, you can't leave me, they don't understand biblical separation. Biblical separation is not about leaving your spouse. Biblical separation is about putting the marriage in a position to better evaluate what's wrong without the emotions or anger or, or without the tension and address it. Biblical separation also allows for professionals to come in and the those who are spiritually wise to come in and give wise counsel. Sometimes the problem is you. And you thought it was your spouse, but the problem actually was you. Sometimes the problem is that, um, you know, you, you let old things contaminate today. And so you didn't forgive. You didn't honor. You didn't. And um, there are a lot of couples that don't have conflict resolution skills. The best thing that I encourage you to do, if you're constantly fighting with your spouse and you love, because you can argue so much that your feelings toward your spouse can start to change. Years of fighting damages marriages. And it changes how you feel. Somebody said, I thought y'all loved each other, but I cannot argue with you every day and still have the same romantic um, intensity that I had when we first got together. If you're arguing with somebody, are you giving each other the silent treatment every day? You keep ignoring me every day. I promise you, I will not have the same romantic intensity that I had in the beginning. So some of the tools that a lot of marriages are used, that you have the spirit of avoidance in marriage. If you got the spirit of avoidance in your marriage, you're killing your marriage. That means you don't uh, talk about certain subjects. You avoid certain things and you're dancing around hoping God come down and just fix it. Without having enough courage to say, baby, we need to talk. This issue right here is a cancer in our marriage. And we need to address that. Some of you have the spirit of avoidance. That tool is killing your marriage. Some of you have the spirit uh, of, of irritation. Uh, you, you won't let it go. You keep talking about it. You, you keep massaging it. You keep bringing it up. You keep and you just... You just won't let it, you won't let it die. You won't let it go. Because you just, you talk about it every chance that you get. That's not profitable. If you don't learn how to let things go in your marriage, then you won't have a marriage for too much longer. Every time a family reunion, every time something comes up, there you go, you bringing up old stuff. You got to let that go. Some of you, um... Some some of you don't know how to talk. Some of you some of you think you communicate, but you omit information. You yell. You scream. You're not as good of a communicator. I know they say that uh, women communicate better than men, but I, I, I've seen it on both sides of the aisle. There are some men that are horrible communicators. They did they talk for thirty minutes, and and you didn't understand nothing what they said. There are some women who drop a whole lot of facts, but they made no sense. Uh, talking doesn't mean you've communicated because good communication has understanding in it. So if you're trying to communicate to your spouse, at some point you got to stop talking and ask your spouse to repeat back to you what you said and did they understand what you mean. If you never pause for understanding, then you're doing a whole lot of talking, but you're not communicating. And you think you're a good communicator, but you talk because you, you talk a lot and you said a lot of words, but that doesn't mean you're a good communicator. Um, when you stay away too long, you leave space for the devil to come in. Matter of fact, we read this in verse one, uh, verse one and two. Um, for you to be emotionally and physically detached from your spouse. Some people are faithful. But if you abandon them. Uh, they only got about two or three weeks worth of strength. <laughs> We don't talk about that enough in the church. Some married, you only have about two or three. This is why when a lot of people get divorced, they go uh, and they become highly sexually active after divorce. 
because actually they don't know how to withstand. They didn't. This is why divorce is so damaging, because when the marriage is finalized or when the divorce is finalized, now they have to go back to being single and they don't know how to say no because they're used to or, or at least had the expectation that they were going to receive. And now they're living in a world where everybody's sleeping around or everybody's doing and they don't know how to say no. This is why uh, marriage is very damaging to men and, and divorce. I mean, divorce is very damaging to men and, and divorce is very damaging to uh, women who were in relationships and not in relationships anymore. So then they start dating again and they start treating their dating life like they did when they were married. Because they don't know how to have boundaries. Any, they got to reestablish all of these boundaries that they forgot about. And they're trying to get back out and date and all that kind of stuff. And now they're living with guilt because they're doing it all wrong. The Bible says. And come together again. I want to co close with that part. You got to come together again. Biblical separation is with a plan. It is organized. It's with a set time. It is with prayer. It is with fasting. And hopefully and prayerfully, you have brought in some professionals and your preacher or those who are spiritually astute to be able to strengthen and say some things. Sometimes during your separation, you can't tell your family, you can't tell your friends, you can't, uh, you can't, you know, you got your friends all around and they're all, you know, invested in your marriage and they all want to see. But, but sometimes if you are trying to work on your marriage, you can't include them. They'll say the wrong things and they'll go in the wrong direction. So uh, I pray that this has been a blessing to you. I pray that uh, it has caused some of you. This is a tool that you should use. You shouldn't just be arguing with your spouse and just jump straight over into divorce. You should use separation as a tool to help your marriage, not destroy it. It's not about leaving your spouse. It's about creating a new space for healing. Change the way you look at separation. Biblical separation is to put ourselves in a new position to work on our marriage from a different angle so that we can get healthy and strong and have a better uh, vantage point and we can better look at ourselves to see what God has called us to do. Hit that like button. Hit that share button. Let's get this message out. Uh, people may have never studied this before. Study this. Learn how that you should be able to be with your wife uh, and be with your husband. Love your spouse. Love your spouse. Also, we thank you for all of our supporters. Thank you so much. We want you to be able, uh, if, if you desire to support this ministry, you can hit that link below and you'll be able to uh, send your love offering and your support to this ministry. And we thank each and every one of you who does uh, that for this ministry. Listen, I want to let you know something. We are here to heal, to help and restore. Be blessed. <laughs>